Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The text is the Gospel reading, the account about John the Baptist, from Luke chapter 3. Dayton Curry was 13 years old, 5 foot 2, and weighed soaking wet 100 pounds. Dayton and his family escaped war torn Liberia. Once in America, his family settled in Philadelphia. In 2011, Nathan Curry was a new kid in Philadelphia with a single mom who was an African immigrant looking for work. That's the kind of kid bullies spot from a million miles away. One day for 30 minutes, seven teenage bullies kicked and beat Nathan, dragged him through the snow, stuffed him into a tree, and hung him on a seven-foot spiked fence. Nathan survived the attack and would have faced another one if it hadn't been for the folly of one of the bullies. Maybe you can imagine what that folly was. He filmed it all and posted it on YouTube. Perhaps you've noticed that for many of these people, intelligence is not their strong suit. Police saw it and threw the bullies behind bars. A worker on the nationwide morning show called The View, no doubt you've heard of it, heard about it and invited Nathan to appear on the broadcast. Unknown to Nathan, the producer had also invited three members of the Philadelphia Eagles football team to appear on the show as well. One was all-pro wide receiver Sean Deshaun Jackson. Jackson said, Naden, I'm here for you, man. Anytime you need me. Then, in full view of every bully in Philly, Deshaun Jackson gave Naden Curry his cell phone number. Bullies think twice before they harass a kid who has an NFL player's number on speed dial. We've all had our share of bullies. Fuzzy Malink comes to my mind. As in my case, someone bigger and older delights in picking on someone much smaller. And back in the day, I was Naden Curry's size, if not even a little smaller. If word got out that it was your birthday, Fuzzy greeted you with a few extra pound, poundings. One, two, three, four, well, it was the bruises on the outside are long gone, but bruises on the inside remain. The fact that I remember Fuzzy's name and probably have forgotten many of my own classmates' names after all these years is a testament to that. But you and I face bigger bullies than Fuzzy Malink. Bullies who can do far more damage than push you around or, or beat you up. Try these out for size. Shin and shame. Guilt and blame. My guess is that you've met up with these dashingly duos a time or two. The biggest bully on the block, however, is a liar and the father of lies. We know him as the devil. Satan. Satan hits us with his lies and rubs our face in our dirt. He wants to destroy us. Like a roaring lion, he's out to devour us. So we run. And we run some more. And we keep on running. That's why God sent a man named John. John the Baptist. The setting. In his first two verses of chapter 3, Luke provides the setting, answering the questions, when, who, and where. In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, and Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip, tetrarch of the region of Iturea and Trachonitis, and Lysanias, tetrarch of Abilene, during the high priest of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. Who? Luke 
also tells us that John is the son of Zechariah. That's reminding us of God's amazing intervention that led Zechariah and Elizabeth, an elderly couple well beyond the childbearing years, to have their miracle son, John. There. At the end of Luke 1, John is a young boy in the wilderness waiting for his public appearance to Israel. Now, at the beginning of Luke 3, John is still in the wilderness, but the waiting is over. John's ministry begins. And his ministry is for people frantically on the run. The salvation. All flesh shall see the salvation of our God. This is great news. Salvation is for all people, even people who feel as though they are running for their lives. People running from problems that no one else understands. People running from bad relationships, bad feelings, and bad breaks. People running from a painful past, a perplexing present, and an uncertain future. running even from God. For such people there is salvation. All flesh shall see the salvation of our God. The shepherds see the salvation of God. Simeon says my eyes have seen your salvation. Fishermen tax collectors all kinds of sinners are drawn to Jesus and see God's salvation. And from a sycamore tree, even Zacchaeus, the wee little man, sees the salvation of our God. The angel puts it this way to a group of shepherds on Christmas. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all When the liar is rubbing my face in my sin and shame, guilt and blame, too often I run to all the wrong places. It's easy to look to other people, and my job, my accomplishments, and my money, and my stuff. These are good gifts. These are grand gifts, but these are not my salvation. There's only one salvation that can defeat devils, demons, and darkness. Watch out. We can all be self deceived. Self deception is anything but new. Do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. The Pharisees and Sadducees, named in Matthew, Matthew 3, verse 7, missed God's salvation because of their pride. They believed that by virtue of their Jewishness, they were guaranteed a place in the covenant. We have Abraham as our father, they said with a swagger. People today make the same mistake, looking to themselves and not to God. Inward, not upward. John says that we are saved not by virtue of our pedigree or performance, but by God's grace, God's amazing and life-changing grace. Grace, John says, comes through repentance and baptism in which our roles are completely passive. God acts, we receive. That's the way of the gospel. By means of the law, we come to the realization that we have nowhere else to run. Then by the power of the gospel, we surrender to God's love, distance ourselves from our past ways of sin, and run to the coming one of John's preaching, to Jesus. Jesus, who is the Savior. As the people were in expectation and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Christ, John answered them all, saying, I baptize you with water, but he who is mightier than I is coming, 
the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. John is not the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed Davidic deliverer and king. <clears throat> John is the proclaimer. Jesus has the power. Run to Jesus. And Jesus comes to fight the bullies on our behalf. That's what Luke 4 is all about. Jesus meets the bully in the wilderness and three times defeats him with a thunderous, it is written. Throughout Luke's gospel, Jesus casts out devils and demons. Jesus binds the strong man, a clear reference to Satan. Jesus announces the salvation of our God. Jesus fights Satan. Jesus fights Satan for our health and for our family. Jesus fights for our salvation and for our restoration. And Jesus fights for our final resurrection. Are the odds against you? Is the boss against you? Is your health against you? Or your emotions against you? Does it seem like everything is against you? Life is hard. Times are difficult, for sure. But Jesus fights for you. Against you. You who have fallen short, turned aside, gone your own way. You who have been tempted and lost. You who have been bullied and bruised by the enemies that seek to destroy you. You with the aging body, the bad back, bad credit, you with problems at work and struggles at home. Whatever the problem, whatever the issue, Jesus fights for the use of the world. You are a you, aren't you? Then Jesus fights Satan for you. Jesus defeats Satan for you. And the day is coming when Jesus will destroy Satan for you. The lake of fire, as we learn in Revelation chapter 20, the lake of fire will be the final home of this bully. On that day, he will make right all that is wrong in this world. No more sin, sickness, sorrow. No more bullies. In the meantime, Jesus even gives you his number on speed dial. And that would be B-I-B-L-E, Bible. There in the pages of Scripture, you will find how Jesus took on Satan in the wilderness, trusting in God's word, how he faced down Satan and won. And in the Garden of Gethsemane, with his biggest challenge looming in front of him, he won again. He so trusted his father that he declared, not my will, but thine. That will is what it costs. But rather than face Satan head on, using the armor we have been given, including the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, we run away. Even with Christ on our side and the promise, he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. We keep on running running from the bully on the block, the father of lies, the devil himself, trying to again rub our face in the dirt. But here's the good news. We don't have to keep running through life. Why is that? God sent a man named John, John the Baptist. The setting? 29 AD, in the wilderness. The salvation for all people. The self-deception. I don't need repentance and baptism. The Savior. The Savior, Jesus. And Jesus invites us to stop running, turn around and look straight into his tender eyes, run into his outstretched arms 
crumbs once nailed to a cross. Jesus invites us to trust these magnificent words of 1 Samuel 17, 47. He says that will just be a nice little motto on the wall. 1 Samuel 17, 47. The battle belongs to the Lord. The battle belongs to the Lord. Not to me. Not to you. To the Lord. With him, born, crucified, risen, our victory is assured. Amen. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds through Christ.